This video is sponsored by Brilliant. We're coming up on the five year anniversary of me starting to learn machine learning and I thought it would be nice to reflect on how I would do it differently if I had to start over. This video was inspired by a video that one of my friends Ken made on his channel about how he would learn data science if he had to start over. So if you're curious about that, definitely go check out his channel. He's great. And I'll make a quick note that this is based on my experiences as someone who uses a lot of applied machine learning for graduate research. So your learning style might differ or your needs might differ, but hopefully this will be generally helpful to everyone who's interested in getting into the field. Lastly, if you'd like to see what the day-to-day -day life of being a grad student doing this kind of work is, you should follow me on Instagram because that's where I do most of my posting with that. All right, so if I had to start over completely from scratch, the first thing that I would start with is building a really solid foundation in math. Specifically, I would focus on calculus, linear algebra, differential equations, and optimization theory. And for me, this is because when I got into machine learning, I was doing it for a specific summer project. So I came in with a very black box model perspective, not necessarily understanding what was going on behind the scenes, but still trying to apply models to the problems that I was interested in solving. And what I've learned over the last several years is that you can start off that way, but eventually you're going to have to understand what's happening behind the scenes. And ideally, if you want to especially tweak models that have been pre-built for your custom needs, it makes it a lot easier if you know what kind of math you're attempting to do so that you can just implement it directly. For example, there are two popular loss metrics used in machine learning, the L1 and L2 loss. And when I first started learning machine learning, I understood that they were different mathematical equations, but I didn't really understand what they meant in terms of how that changes your optimization problem. I also didn't understand how choices like that factor into things like algorithmic fairness and bias issues, which I'll talk about a little bit later in this video. Also, there's a lot of interesting new machine learning methods that are rooted in partial differential equations. So it would have been helpful to not have to relearn that as I started reading papers about that in the last like year or so. Now, I took calculus, linear algebra, and differential equations as a college student during my undergrad. So if you are in college and this is a path that you're interested in pursuing, you can take those classes through your school. But if you don't have those kinds of resources, I would check out places like MIT Open Courseware. They have the full course materials for all of these courses that you can go through yourself. If you're looking for something with a little bit more structure, you might also check out a website like Brilliant, which has courses on advanced mathematics, including linear algebra, differential equations, calculus, and machine learning courses once you get through those topics. And to be clear, this would all be before I would start coding. I had already learned to code before I started learning machine learning, so I had that foundation, but I think that learning the math separately can be helpful for when it comes time to implement things. And on that note, I actually still haven't taken any formal coursework in optimization theory. I might try to do that while I'm at MIT. Instead, a lot of what I know is self-taught, but it's definitely something that I wish I'd taken either more time to learn by myself up front or taken formal coursework in because optimization theory is pretty central to making sure that your algorithm actually works correctly and does the thing that you want it to do. So once I'd built that solid foundation in math, I would learn to program. And technically these two steps can be done in parallel on the timeline, depending on how much time you have. As I mentioned, I'd already learned how to program by the time that I was learning machine learning. So I knew MATLAB, Java, and some Python. So I don't know that I would have done that much more learning, but if I were starting from scratch, I would probably focus on Python, C, and then an object-oriented framework. So something like Java. I would start with Python mostly because it's pretty much the most widely used programming language in machine learning. So it's something that everyone kind of knows by default and it will make it easier for you to look at other people's code and understand what's going on as well as implement code that other people can use. Plus there's a ton of free resources for it. Most machine learning libraries are built on Python. So it just makes a lot of sense to start there. C is then helpful for understanding essentially what's happening behind the scenes and getting a better idea of how to optimize code for speed, especially if you're working on projects that require models to run particularly fast. And then the object-oriented programming is something that I found helpful for writing systems and programs that aren't redundant and that run efficiently by creating class structures so that you can just call things instead of trying to redefine things every six lines because that's the way that you originally wrote the code. But if I had to pick one language, I would definitely start with Python. Everything else you can pick up as you need to. And then once I'd had a handle on Python, I probably would have taken something like Fast.ai's Practical Deep Learning for Coders course because it's a great way of essentially taking that mathematical foundation that you've already built and combining it with the 
programming knowledge that you now have so that you can actually build deep learning systems. Another class that you could take is something like Andrew Nick's Coursera class. There are a ton of other online intro to machine learning resources. So MIT OpenCourseWare has the materials for 6036, which is the intro to machine learning course at MIT. I think that any of those are a great way to basically take your theoretical knowledge and your practical knowledge and put them together in a way that is useful. So now that I would have had a very strong background in mathematics, as well as the programming skills to implement algorithms that I was interested in working with, I would have done a lot more reading. And this might sound counterintuitive. I know that in an earlier video where I talked about how to learn machine learning for free, one of the things that I really focused on was project-based learning, and I definitely still agree with that, and we'll touch on that a little bit later in the video. But I think that I didn't read particularly widely when I was first getting into the field and tended to focus on things that were relevant to the types of problems that I thought that I was trying to solve. And what I've realized over the last several years is that there are a lot of interesting methods that can be applied outside of the context that they are applied in a paper and might be useful to you because even if the subject matter of the paper is very different from what you work on, the underlying problem that the researchers are attempting to solve might actually be similar in how it's structured and the type of data that it's trying to use. I also just think it's a good idea to start reading the literature sooner rather than later because you'll start to pick up the terminology that's being used in the field to describe different types of systems and different types of problems. You will get an idea of where the field is going and the, the different directions that the field is going in. You'll get an idea of how people train and test models and kind of what the standards within the field are for rigorously training and testing models to see how well they work. And you'll get an idea of what open challenges there are where you might have ideas on how to tackle them. On top of reading more technical stuff, I would also definitely read fairly broadly into other fields that overlap into machine learning, so fields like economics, neuroscience, psychology, social sciences, because there's a lot of really interesting work going on over there. Because I think especially now it's really helpful to be able to translate between multiple fields. There's a lot of work that goes on in fields like algorithmic fairness where the set of definitions used there is not necessarily what people in other fields would use. So bias is a common example of this, where bias in algorithmic fairness means something different than bias in statistics. And knowing that and being able to understand what people are talking about in the context of their work is really helpful. I also would have taken something on data ethics and machine learning ethics. So fast.ai actually has a practical data ethics course that you might check out. And I would do that because everyone comes into programming with different biases, everyone comes in with different lived experiences and blind spots, and I think that it's important to just be aware of that and be aware of where you might miss things early on so that you can hopefully design systems with that in mind and avoid some of the more obvious bias and fairness related issues that tend to crop up in machine learning problems. So along with that, I would start working on some actual problems, implementing my own models, and in particular, I would try to re-implement well-known models from popular papers. So models like transformers are a great start because by re-implementing these models yourself, it gives you a lot more intuition into how they work and how you might tweak them to suit your needs. And at the end of the day, when you actually want to use them, it might make more sense for you to load a pre-built GPT-2 model and use that instead of building one yourself. But actually understanding what's happening behind the scenes will end up being helpful for you later on. In terms of data, I would probably start start off with things that are publicly available on the internet. So websites like Kaggle are a great resource if you're looking for data sets to play with and predefined problems. Google also has a public data sets search engine that you can just look through available data sets and see which ones interest you the most. At some point, I also would have wanted to do a project where either I collected the data or the data was not as well organized and cleaned as it often is in places like Kaggle, because I think it's important to deal with raw data so that you understand the types of data science problems that you tend to run into well before you get into the actual machine learning side of things. So now that we've developed that mathematical foundation, we've developed our programming skills, we've read into the literature, have an understanding of the field, where it's going, what types of problems are currently still open challenges for people, and especially within whatever type of research you're in, what types of problems people are using machine learning for, and what kind of the open questions are. I think the last thing that I would focus on when it comes to starting to learn machine learning all over again and getting me up to now is focusing a lot less on machine learning. And this is especially as someone who 
focuses on applied machine learning research. I think that when I started doing research, I often came in assuming that machine learning was going to be the solution and that the challenge for me was to figure out how to use machine learning to get to that solution or what network architecture was going to work, what type of optimizer was going to get me the best results. And in hindsight, over the past several years, I realized that there are a lot of situations where machine learning probably wasn't the solution or the scope that I was thinking of was too narrow because I wasn't well read enough in the field. And so I think that if I had to go back and start over again, I would try to approach problems from the perspective of the problem and the solution that we're trying to get out of it and take a much broader view at the possible solutions that could be used to reach that goal. And I think that part of it would be being a little more creative. Um, I think that part of it is being more well-read, but I think that part of it is also just realizing that sometimes machine learning isn't actually the solution to your problem, or sometimes the model that you need to use isn't a 75 billion parameter language model. It's very good feature engineering so that you extract the information that's actually useful from your data. And then a pretty simple principal component analysis or linear classifier that gets you the rest of the way. So I'll include links to all of the resources that I mentioned in the description box and definitely leave a comment below if there are other resources that you found helpful so that we can all learn from each other. And if you want to keep learning more about what I do outside of YouTube, you can again follow me on Instagram and TikTok as well as Twitter where I talk a lot more about what I do for my PhD. So I mentioned a lot of great resources in this video but a lot of them are geared towards college students or people who can set aside a decent amount of time to watch long lectures and work on programming projects. But a lot of you might not have time for that between your nine to five job and commitments that you might have at home. I know that I don't have time to be taking a full course load on top of my work commitments right now. And if this sounds like you but you still want to get some hands-on experience with machine learning, you should check out Brilliant. Brilliant is a website and app built off this very principle. You learn best while doing and solving in real time. Jump right into solving problems and being coached bit by bit until, before you even realize it, you've learned a new subject in STEM. You won't have to memorize long messy formulas and endless facts, just pick a course you're interested in and get started. Feeling stuck or made a mistake? You can read the explanations to find out more and learn at your own pace. Brilliant has something for everybody, whether you want to start the basics of math, science, and computer science, or dive into cutting edge topics like cryptocurrency and neural networks. And their courses are laid out like a story, broken down into pieces so that you can tackle them a little bit at a time. The best part is there's no tests and no grades, so you can just pick a course based on what you're interested in and get going. If you're interested in joining me and a community of 8 million learners and educators today, click on the link in the description or sign up at brilliant.org slash click on the link in the description or visit brilliant.org slash Jordan today to sign up for free. In fact, the first 200 people to go to that link will also get 20% off the annual premium subscription. Otherwise, if you like this video, you can let me know by smashing the like button and subscribing to my channel. You can also check out the video that I did a few years ago on how to learn AI for free if you're interested in some other resources that I didn't touch on here. If you want to follow my PhD life, you can do so on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. And otherwise, I will see you all on Monday. Bye.